two Italians, <laughs> big trouble. Um, anyway, so um, this presentation really has nothing new, especially from the technical side, but I wanted to give you a kind of a state of affairs of where the wireless industry and, and why they're a network more than anything else um, is at, and um, at least in the first part of the presentation, and the second part I'll touch on a few other, few other topics. So let's see if it works. Maybe not, because I had to turn it on this way. Okay, so this is really the biggest platform in the history of mankind. Uh, there are six billion wireless subscription now. Am I standing in your way, by the way? Okay. Um, we are right now really in the swing of transitioning from 2G to 3G. Of course, most of you have been working on 4G for the past five years, but from the commercial standpoint, we're just at the beginning. Uh, 10 years from now, if I had to give this talk, probably substitute 3G with 4G and we will have the same situation. Um, so there's 1.6 billion 3G connection now. They're estimated to grow to over 3 billion uh, by 2015. And it's really been uh, the, the, the result of a perfect storm of device capabilities, applications, compelling applications now, uh, networks, improvements, uh, all these things have come together to create this incredible growth in, in this industry. Uh, right now, there are uh, 10, 10 uh, 3G subscribers added every second of every day, of every uh, month in the year. So 10 per second. Um, so, and, and that's the growth pretty much. Uh, and again, as I said, shift this to the right by another 10 years, you'll have the transition from 3G to, uh, to 4G. Uh, and right now, we're still at a small percentage, it's about 32%, if I remember correctly, of 3G connections in the worldwide subscribers. So there is you know, a, right, a long runway uh, to go up. They're expecting to double now. Uh, we're about 1 billion, 1.3 billion, and uh, go to 3 billion. So the, the numbers are really mind-boggling in terms of size of what this industry has been able to accomplish. If we define broadband connections, uh, starting from 3G data systems, whether it's uh, HSPA uh, or EVDO, <coughs> TDS-CDMA now in China, LTE is still a very small number, but included in that, then this is the picture of uh, mobile broadband connections versus fixed broadband connections. And uh, you can see it's already surpassed uh, the broadband connections now, uh, the mobile versus the fixed. And obviously that gap is growing uh, pretty large. The smartphone has really been a turning point uh, in, this, in, this, in this industry. Uh, right now the, the, the base, the uh, installed base of smartphone has surpassed in 2011 the installed base of PCs. Uh, there's about 800 million smartphones out there, 720 roughly, 700 million uh, uh, installed base of PCs. And that, again, is gonna trend uh, in that direction. And it's really, uh, what is driving is really the, now the com compelling application. The consumer is really driving this, this explosion. Um, Operators are increasing smartphone sales. Now Verizon Wireless, uh, in 2011, 55% of their new phones sold are smartphones, uh, smartphone category. Uh, in other operators, it's roughly similar, uh, the growth. Uh, as I said, uh, applications are really making big difference. Uh, 20 billion applications have been downloaded around the world. And, uh, and OEMs, uh, amazingly enough, I was a, a little, a uh, little trivia, uh, cumulatively there were more than 6,500 3G capable uh, models of phones that have been manufactured by, they told me, 270 different manufacturers. I know about 12 manufacturers, I don't know what the other 250 are, but there are 270 manufacturers that are manufacturing phones around the world now. And the, <clears throat> the growth is, not surprisingly, going to come 
from the developing uh, regions. Right now it's 300 million units in 2010, and uh, fast forward to 2015, uh, half, 50% is gonna come from the developing regions. One billion units will be sold of smartphones by 2015. And uh, so the rate now shipping on smartphone projected for 3015 is about 30 hertz. It will be 30 smartphones uh, shipped every second. So the number is uh, really uh, incredible. And what is, what is happening is the blurring of lines, now the transition to smartphones is happening. You know, the, 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 the price of smartphones is coming down. There is real, very little differentiation now from high-end feature phones to smartphones, so the transition is happening towards smartphones. Typically, you know, Android is, is a big driver of that. Um, the low basic and premium, the less than $300, is growing at a 40% compounded annual growth rate. Uh, the high-end, the high greater than $300, is growing at 15%. And as I said, the, uh, <clears throat> the blurring of the lines between what used to be high-end features phone on the left, they're just now moving into that category. And uh, there are sub-150 Android-based. It's gonna come down, that price is gonna come down uh, continuously in the future. Uh, actually, we're pretty close to 120 now uh, for low-end smartphones. And that's what is fueling that growth and that uh, you know, huge number that I, that I showed you before. So it's really amazing what, what has been happening in this industry in terms of growth and participation from OEMs, uh, phone manufacturers, from application developers, from network providers. Um, it's, it's been really an incredible ride. So this is where we're at in terms of, of the industry. These are the numbers. Um, there is a whole new category now that is gonna take hold, um, just the beginning. Um, beyond, beyond phones, uh, non-handset type uh, broadband connections, whether it's from M2M applications, whether it's tablets, uh, or other type of devices. And uh, that is expected to grow at 40%, so the number is very small now, but it's gonna grow at a pretty high uh, tick. So we have this whole now new uh, area of, this is gonna fuel even more uh, business in this industry. And the tablet, another fairly recent phenomenon, it's uh, again expected to grow at this compounded rates, which are pretty darn uh, exciting actually, from 2010 to 2015. So it's another category of devices gonna, that is gonna grow very, very, a very high pace. Um, another exciting thing is now the introduction of Windows 8 for tablets and phones that is, is coming soon. So Microsoft now is getting into the fold. And uh, from the first ones that I've seen, I haven't played around with it too much, but it's pretty darn good actually. So we'll see how it goes in terms of uh, attach rate and, and consumer response to that. But uh, it's another uh, big impulse for this particular segment. So the growth continues whether it's in the smartphone business, is in the new device categories, tablets, M2Ms, uh, it seems like there is really, really a lot of uh, growth. And with that, data traffic is growing as well because now these phones are consuming much more data than the, than the previous generations. In 2010, it's grown by 2x. Everybody's projecting 10 to 20x, 12x. Uh, for the next five years, hard to tell. We'll, we'll see how that goes. But it could not be surprised that the demand for it could be even a thousand times in, in the next 10 to 20 years. So that's uh, pretty much where, where the numbers are, all these factoids. And uh, so what, you know, I, I always get asked, especially from students, okay, what do we do next? It feels like it's a mature industry, and, and it is, honestly. Uh, there is still an awful lot of stuff to do, but it has matured substantially in the past 25 years. And it's fueling, a, you know, I, I put five vectors there. Um, there is probably more, but this is, I think, in my opinion, probably the, the, more, the most relevant ones. Uh, low power, high performance computing, 
the wireless industry is driving all that research in that area. Low power, flexible radio frequency. There are now, if you uh, look at the available frequency bands around the world, there is more than 40 of them. Uh, whether it's an 800, 900, 2100, 2600, you name it. There's 40 different uh, radio frequency bands. And one of the challenges is to design transceivers that cover a, a large range of bands at uh, very low power consumption. And you see that uh, the low power is really <clears throat> a critical thing here that, happen that happens in those first two vectors. And uh, it's, it is indeed one of the critical issues in design of devices now is the, is the low power. Um, as a matter of fact, when somebody comes up with uh, new algorithms, uh, we tell them that you know, unless it has negative current consumptions, you have no hope. Um, that's so critical. It's really, really one of the major issues now in, in the design of those devices. Uh, high level operating system applications, obviously a whole area of, of work that is, being, that is going on there. Spectrum crunch, how do we deal with the data demand and how do we deal with the expected growth of data demand, uh, tenfold or twentyfold or a thousandfold, whatever it's gonna be. And that's a whole new category of devices which is, you know, goes under the, the term of Internet of Things. Uh, many of them that transmit very rarely and very little amount of data, but there is a lot of them. So uh, I'm going to just touch on, on the first one, uh, low power, high performance computer. I'll give you, you know, there's a little bit of advertising here for Qualcomm, but hey. Um, where, where we're at in terms of uh, state, state of the art, at least from our side, and if I look back at uh, you know, the last 20 years, um, it's, it's incredible what, what happened. Uh, from the first, gener first generation of cellular to second generation, third generation, so on and so forth. In 89, when we demonstrated CDMA for the first time, it took a whole van to, to hold uh, the mobile device. Uh, in 91, we, we finally got to the, the chips, but we needed three to implement, needed three chips to implement uh, the CDMA modem, just the modem. Uh, now, fast forward to 2011, not only we have multi, uh, multi-mode modems from 2G to multi-mode 3G to LTE, FDD, and TDD versions of it, uh, which at the end of the day only takes a very small percentage of the area of these devices. But there's multi-core CPUs. They need to run at very low, uh, efficiently, very efficiently, at low power consumption, at high, at high clock frequencies, uh, integrated GPSs, multiple DSPs, Every connectivity that uh, you know, people demand these days, whether it's Wi-Fi, USB, NFC, Bluetooth, uh, graphics, another area that is incredibly important. Um, so multi-core GPUs for graphics performance and, and all that, you know, 1080, 1080p video and, and all that. So that's all packed now into one, one device. The node is 28 nanometers uh, at this point. Uh, these are the first devices that come out at 28 nanometers. Um, and, uh, and the drive is still to uh, integrate more things and to lower the power consumption of these devices. That's absolutely what people demand, to keep optimizing uh, for power consumption. So that's uh, in the area of uh, low power, high performance computing, there is an awful lot of work going on, um, as there is in, in the RF. Uh, side of things. And um, so I have, I have to say, if I, if it was a personal observation. Uh, at this stage, honestly, I think we are really in an implementation phase in the, you know, in the industry. The focus, if I look at the bulk of the resources that are devoted, I would say that uh, you know, the fundamental theoretical stuff has been de decreasing and now the bulk of the resources are really devoted to these issues, um, whether it's software development, RF development, and, and uh, circuit design is really where the, the focus is. And then Alon asked me to put down my thoughts on the contributions of, of this uh, community. And honestly, you know, this growth uh, that this industry has generated 
the fundamental key ideas originated from, from this community, let's face it. Um, you know, most of the key things that allow, that allow this thing to, uh, to happen uh, came from here. So I tried, and here I'm gonna be in a minefield because this is my, my version. Everybody in this room will have their own version. And I might as well put a bullseye here and then you can throw errors. You will not detect any biases in this list, uh, which by the way, I got tired yesterday. I decided to watch the Super Bowl, so it's, it's a shortened version of it. Uh, but I would say, you know, from my perspective, I think, and, and I had to bracket it in time too. I couldn't start from, you know, last century. So I started from like 1G to 2G kind of transition. I'd say interfering averaging was a, was a key uh, aspect of this, but, uh, allowed us to realize frequency reuse of one, universal frequency reuse for the first time. That was a, a big accomplishment. Uh, and it came obviously from fundamental theoretical um, understanding. Channel coding, uh, convolutional turbo decoding, viterbi decoding, tera decoding, obviously there's the LDPC there in there. I didn't have space to put it in. Uh, critical component of how these devices actually perform. Uh, adaptive modulation and opportunistic scheduling, I think that was another very good thing for data services um, that, that happened, real, realizing that paradigm. Uh, interference cancellation was another big accomplishment, um, you know, from theory uh, to practice. I thought that was that's, uh, awesome, actually, that we were able to accomplish that. MIMO, for sure from using antenna for simple diversity or power gains to actually spatial, spatial multiplexing. And the second slide is where I started to get tired. And uh, OFDMA, I think that was you know, critical to be able to move to larger bandwidth uh, and uh, gain even more efficiency. Uh, elegant and flexible multiple access, no, no doubt about that. And then I decided to put fountain codes are really uh, critical for robust multicasting. And, um, and multicasting is gonna have to play a big role going forward as broadcast multicasting um, in, the, in, the, in these networks. There's an awful lot of data that, needs to, that wants to be consumed at the end user and then we need to leverage the capability of multicasting in these in this networks um, to become more efficient. So that's, that's, that's my list. And if you look at all these items, and this, there is more, I left out uh, compression and, and many, many other things. But if you look at this list, the fundamental key understanding of the ideas and the theory were developed by, by this community. So we should give ourselves a pat on the back. Um, so where are we at now? So LTE networks, well, folks have worked on them for uh, the past, and the standards for the past uh, six, seven years. I'm trying to find a good position where it doesn't, there is no positive feedback, but I'm failing. Um, and then the phase of implementation that has been going on for the past uh, three years, three, four years actually, uh, where you know, a lot of resources have been dedicated. So if you go to the store now and buy uh, a new smartphone that has 4G LTE capabilities, what you get is this kind of um, capabilities on the devices. The one you're probably buying if you go to the store here will have 10 megahertz capabilities, 10 megahertz uplink, 10 megahertz downlink, but the devices can actually support up to 20 megahertz uplink and 20 megahertz downlink. Uh, the carrier frequencies that are supported right now are typically in the 500 to 3 gigahertz range. They're, they come in both flavors, FTD and, uh, and TDD, although FTD is the one that's being deployed, TDD pretty soon. Uh, the average spectral efficiency that we are achieving now with the networks that are deployed and the device capabilities that we have, uh, you know, in the range of 2 bits per second per, per hertz per cell, peak data rates at 15 bits per second and one to two bits per second on, on, the, on the uplink. The primary phi MAC characteristics of the devices that, that you have right now, uh, OFDM waveform obviously the, on the downlink, single carrier FDM on the uplink, 
with orthogonality, obviously, for intracell uh, users, uh, MIMO capability with uh, multiple TX and RX antennas, QS support, uh, network control, and seamless, seamless mobility, obviously. And then another characteristic important uh, from the higher layer point of view is really the, the new flat network architecture, decentralized, uh, allowed to achieve uh, reduction in latency of the links, better fault tolerance, much uh, cheaper to deploy. So that was another big accomplishment as we moved from the old architecture to the new flat architecture in, in 4G. So that's the release eight and nine. That's what you buy today, pretty much. Uh, what are folks talking about? And I have to be honest with you, I'm not following this area as closely anymore. Uh, but what they're talking about for the future release, so right now in the standards, I decided to put it down as a vertical evolution. And if you look at this, you realize, hmm, this is kind of okay, you know, carrier aggregation, all right, we'll just put more carriers together. Uh, improve MIMO, all right, we'll go from two by two to four by four to eight by eight, okay. Uh, multiple transmit antennas, so this is not very exciting kind of sign of maturity, I think, of where we have, we have uh, the point we're at, pretty much. So from this perspective, really nothing uh, too exciting, uh, my opinion, a lot of work uh, to implement these things, but. Um, and then a couple of other maybe uh, dimensions, horizontal uh, dimensions, uh, work that is going on in what are referred as heterogeneous networks. So this is, Fundamentally, an attempt to go from universal frequency reuse to something that is a reuse greater than one. So how, how do you do that? Well, uh, one fairly reasonable way to do it is you pop down an awful lot of smaller uh, nodes, and uh, <clears throat> which hopefully are lower, lower cost uh, in, in the big picture. So you have your macro network, as it is today, that has the, the coverage, the ubiquitous coverage, and then you pop down an awful lot of small nodes. You partition the resources, but at the end of the day, if I give 50% of the resources to the macro, and then I give 50% to the small uh, coverage area nodes, at the end of the day, I'm going to get a reuse which is greater than one. So work is going on is how do you do this deployment? It's more of a practical, really, uh, type of issues, practical, a set of practical issues that need to be resolved. Uh, but it's definitely one vector in which people are, are um, spending time and, and resources. And then one hop communications, that's already included in the next releases uh, to allow for relay of uh, transmission. And this is all in band, pretty much. Uh, the second dimension horizontal is work that is ongoing on trying to coordinate uh, transmissions from, from the nodes, from the, from the base stations. Fundamentally, what, what the goal is, we have conquered intracell interference, whether through orthogonalization or interference cancellation, but we haven't really conquered the intercell interference. Uh, the interference generated among different uh, base stations in the, in the in the network or between small uh, nodes in the network. So this is what has been discussed for the next releases of uh, LTE. Um, one, the, the last bullets there is another avenue which is taking hold, it's not widely deployed now, but it's becoming to become more and more popular. And it is remote radio heads where you have one central brain and then you string fibers to remote antennas pretty much. The antennas have PAs and LNAs, but then they ship back the radio frequency through the fibers. And then you, at that point, you have a centralized point that has all the information that can do interference management. So you have distributed antennas, basically, but, but they act in a coordinated way. From the from a practical perspective, there are issues in deployment here. You have to string fibers, uh, but in some cases, actually, it's a very feasible and, and kind of the right thing to do. Um, as I was uh, talking to Harry Feister uh, earlier, I was mentioning to him, we have a, a visit from Corning recently, and you know, one of the issues 
For instance, in in-building deployment of remote radio heads that are streamed by fiber was that to deploy the fibers, you needed uh, some highly skilled folks that had to make sure that you, know, you don't bend them too much and so on and so forth. Well, there's a new generation now of fiber optics where you can bend it. The losses are very, very small. So you can string now fibers just like a Cat5, pretty much. So much easier, much lower cost of deployment. So this thing is becoming more and more feasible as, as we go along. So that's uh, what is being discussed right now in the standards, and people are working actively on this path, and uh, pretty sure that all these issues will get uh, pretty much standardized in the next uh, few months, actually. So what do you do after? <clears throat> you know, okay, we got release 8, 9, 10, 11, so we have to think about release 12, apparently. I'm not, again, I'm, I'm not into this one anymore, but. Um, so the, de the challenge is the demand for, for wireless data. That's really the key challenge to try to improve the efficiency of uh, these networks. And the nature of the increased demand, which is going to be a combination of the new device categories. Tablets are going to be big, much bigger consumers of data than, than phones and smartphones. Uh, and then the internet. The Internet of Things, which will be a large density of connected devices, even if they don't transmit very large amount of data, in most cases. So those are the two things that need to be tackled. Uh, one idea, which I think kind of is somewhat um, intuitive, I think, is at, at one potential solution. There's probably multiple of them, but is super dense deployments of very small cells. You've heard about femtocells. In a sense, femtocells have a bad name now because the first product were really very good at all, honestly. They were really more coverage, fill coverage holes. If you don't have coverage in your house, then put a femtocell. But uh, you know they, they work most of the time co-channel. They create problems, interference. So, um, But if, it, if done right, what you're trying to do, essentially, is really to create this, this small uh, hotspot. And you need to be close, to, close enough to a wire. You want to send those bits eventually somewhere, right? So in uh, a dense deployment of tiny, let's call them for now, uh, open access. They have to be open access. If it's closed access, it's closed access. Forget it. It's a nightmare to deal with. And uh, that uh, users, or most, most, most likely users, just deploy, just like a Wi-Fi access point. But this thing runs on license spectrum, is managed and coordinated, has quality of service, and has uh, support for mobility, you know, just like the, the WANs. And, um, and the, 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 the users de uh, deploy them. Um, there was a talk this morning that showed some results, and when they showed me those results, it sounded really uh, promising to me. In addition to, I'm going to pull a Erwin Jacobs stunt where he always pulled things from his pockets. It was always very successful. But the, the two trends is, so th this is a base station right now. Supports 16 users, covers two different radio frequency bands, um, up to, yeah, 16 users, I think. Um, up to 20 dBm of transmit power. So if you look at the, tr I mean, the tallest thing in this thing is the RJ45 connector that attaches to your broadband modem or gateway that you have at home. Um, so if this is the trend, and if I show you this two years from now, it will be a quarter of the size and will cost even less. The cost is trivial. This costs less than a phone, pretty much. And um, so if this is the trend, I think this is really quite an interesting path. Honestly, I think it's a series of practical problems that need to be solved. I don't think there is huge theoretical issues to be dealt with these things. Um, but, uh, but it's certainly a path that could take care of uh, uh, you know, the problems of, uh, of huge data demands. Um, so this, this is really something that uh, folks are starting to think about. Um, if you think about operators and you look at the initial you know, results, 
Suppose an operator has 10 megahertz of spectrum or 20 megahertz of spectrum, and he has a macro <coughs> network deployed. Is he better off dedicating 20 megahertz of spectrum to the macro network by doubling, uh, put another, another uh, radio, radio frequency there on this macro network? Or is he better off deploying 10 megahertz on the macro network to provide the ubiquitous coverage and then distribute, let's say, he, he is an operator that has uh, wire connectivity as well. There are many of them. Not all of them, but many of them. And uh, dedicate 10 megahertz to these things that he gives to his subscribers and they're in, you know, put down into the gateway or set the box or whatever the right device is. Uh, well, if you look at the numbers, it, and this provides coverage also not just for the apartment, it provides coverage from inside to outside as well. And as the density grows, that coverage grows. Uh, is he better off doing this? Well, if the initial results are correct, I believe they are, he is much better off uh, doing this. Because even with a very reasonable, small, I mean, with a small density of these things, uh, the overall efficiency of the system, if I compare the 20 megahertz dedicated to the macro network or 10 dedicated to the macro and 10 dedicated to the small things, the efficiency of the overall network is much, much bigger um, if you go down this path. So that's a, an interesting uh, avenue uh, to deal with, with the data demand. And uh, certainly the cost can be very compelling because these things are really getting small and, and cheaper. So that's all I had uh, put together for today, I think. Yes, I think, I think it, it was. Uh, with that, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them, and uh, thank you very much. So the question was, uh, Moore's law is running out of steam, and is that a problem? Uh, it's not running out of steam quite yet, but certainly if I, if I look forward, fast forward, uh, quite a few years, uh, it will be. And uh, do we have a, an answer right now? I don't think we, we do quite yet. Uh, but we still have runway. You know, we are just starting with 28 nanometers. Uh, we, we have more nodes to go down uh, that path. Um, so it's not going to run out of steam quite yet for at least the next uh, 10 years. So, yeah, yeah, no, I understand exactly. So I'll, I'll repeat the question. Is for the, the little uh, cells that I was showing, there's two issues. There's the interfering managers among them. And the second, and the second thing is the, the backhaul. So the, the idea was, my goodness. The idea was that uh, this will be deployed by, by the users and it will be connected to your broadband connection, uh, so your existing broadband connection. Now the issue there is you need to deal with quality of service because the intent is that these are open access, meaning that everybody can, that is within the coverage and recognizes this can, can access this, but you want to give quality of service to the owner, obviously, of of the cell to his own traffic versus the other traffic. So he had to deal with those issues. But the idea was they're user deployed by folks that already have broadband connection. And if you look around the world, there are many operators that are actually are wireless operators and fixed operators, ISPs, basically. And um, so we did, a, we did a study where, you know, an operator that has both the spectrum for wireless networks and has uh, customers that have the, uh, their broadband connection would deploy these things and, uh, and it's certainly much more beneficial in terms of bits of frequency per hertz per square kilometer. And uh, from the interference management point of view, yes, you have to do the right thing. Uh, this thing, for instance, uh, also has ears. It only doesn't, has ears in the sense that it has a mobile capable device in here that can listen to the network and figure out which channel it should go to and what it should do. So you need to do you know, reasonably smart things, but uh, they're not unresolvable problem. They're a very practical problem, in my, in my opinion. OK. Uh, the question is, what, what do I think about massive MIMO, meaning thousands of antennas per 
uh, installment, basically, per, per, per base station. Um, you're obviously going to have to be at very high frequencies, otherwise we're going to run out of room. Um, so I'm not so sure, honestly. I'm not so sure, because you need to be up in the 60 gigahertz if you want to you know, reasonably compactly put these thousand uh, elements. And then um, there's an awful lot of issues that come with that. So I don't know. I, I really don't have a good answer. But I don't quite see it yet. Well, uh, th so the question is, uh, I, I said femtocells got a bad name because the first product were not very good. So but isn't this kind of the same thing? Well, in a sense, it is. But we, if we do it, we need to do it correctly. Femtocells right now are really closed access gadgets to begin with. Uh, they do very little of interference management and smart things in terms of figuring out what is the right thing to do, actually almost nothing. Um, and uh, so we just need to do a better job. And if the trend is that the cost of this thing goes down you know, in the 10, 20 bucks, uh, then there is a reasonable rationale for, for going down this path and doing the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.